Thank you. We praise you for tonight. I ask you, Lord, you bless, Pastor Lord. Bless your word tonight. I will be done here tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Lucy's not feeling well tonight, so we want to pray for her. And uh, we also want to pray for uh, Brenda, who's in a hospital, but she's coming home tomorrow. I went to see her yesterday, and she's in good spirits, but, you know, just concerned about some things. So uh, let's keep them in prayer. Amen. Father, we just lift up to you, Lucy, tonight. We ask, Father, for a touch upon her back, Lord, upon her body. In the name of Jesus, we thank you that there's healing in the name of Jesus. That whatsoever things we ask in prayer, believing, we shall receive those things. And so, Father, we thank you for your healing. Thank you for touching Sister Lucy tonight. And uh, we just want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Good to have you with us tonight. And we want to also lift up Brenda in prayer. Father, we lift up Brenda to you tonight. Father, we, uh, we thank you for her life, and we thank you, Lord, that you're healing her we thank you, Lord, for that healing touch upon her soul, her spirit, her body, and that, Father, that all of the tests will come back negative, and that, Father, anything that is uh, related by the enemy, we pray against it in the name of Jesus. And what the devil meant for evil, Lord, turn around for good. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I, I heard you had a good meeting last week. Pastor Manny. Good. He's a wild man, isn't he? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. Yeah, his dog passed away, you know, so he's, I guess he's a little sad. I should call him tomorrow, see how he's doing. You know, pets are like family, you know what I mean? You get used to them, you know? Praise the Lord. Um, just give you a little update. Um, my trip so far tentatively will be September 25th. I'll be going to, uh, leaving from Boston to Dubai, from Dubai to Bangalore. I'll be in Bangalore for 10 days, and then from Bangalore back to Dubai, and from Dubai to Nigeria, where I'll be there for seven days. And so then I'll be leaving there and coming back home. So. Uh, um, I've got a, a goal. I like to set maybe about four thousand dollars to raise. Um, I've already raised a promise that I have from somebody. Already raised two thousand, and so um, and he said there will be more um, coming uh, from that. So um, that's going to pay for my hotel. That's going to pay for my my trip with the extra leg room because I cannot stand being in that little sardine for 13 and a half hours and then for another seven and a half hours. Uh, so uh, I got to get that extra leg room. So um, praise the Lord. And um, I got another pastor friend of mine that's inviting me to come and preach. So I'll be going there also. I'll be traveling in August uh, to Baton Rouge for a weekend there with Brother Diamond, and um, where else am I going? I don't know, I'm going somewhere else. But anyway, to raise money for this trip. my I would love to see 5000 so I can go, and we're going to be going to some of the villages, I understand, and visit just as, you know, friends, you know. And so um, we want to be uh, careful. So praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm excited. How what God's doing already. When God opens the door, he opens the door, right? Okay, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be studying tonight about interpreting symbols. Symbols. Interpreting symbols. I believe it's, is it lesson 17 or 18 in your? I think it's 17. I think I'm one ahead of you because it's the teacher's manual. Or one behind you. I don't know, I'm not sure. Which one is it, Annie? Okay, that's all right. 
What, is the, what does it say? 17 or 18? Or not? 19? Yeah, okay, so I'm one behind. Okay, I'm one behind only in number, but it's the same lesson. Mine, mine says 18, but that's okay. We're going to talk about interpreting symbols tonight. <clears throat> I think I got maybe two more, two or three of the most left on this particular subject. And then we'll, um, we'll say what the Lord wants us to study next. Or maybe one of you will give a Bible study. Huh? Wouldn't that be nice? For a little while. Um, take turns. Sharing one night. That'd be good. <clears throat> okay. Interpreting symbols. One of the most diverse areas of biblical study is that which deals with this interpretation of symbolic or typical language. Uh, it's very similar to the similes and the things that we studied before but has a little different connotation to it. And even though the word symbol does not occur in most translations of the Bible, you'll see symbols everywhere. Uh, they're a valid part of biblical language. The interpretation of symbols is in some ways related to the previous lessons on figures of speech that we talked about, and I shared that with you. So number one, why is it so important to have a strict guideline for the interpretation of symbols? Let me ask you that question. Why is it so important to have strict guidelines for the interpretation of symbols? Does anyone know? Because there's no other area that has generated so many wild and strange doctrines. Okay? People take symbols and they make doctrines out of them. I'll give you an example, you know, when the, uh, Peter walked by and his shadow fell on somebody and they got healed, then people came out with a shadow ministry. Uh, when Paul's handkerchief was laid on somebody and the demons left and they got healed, they made a handkerchief ministry out of it now. Okay, so they go symbols. Again, those things are not wrong in and of themselves, only directed by God if he says to do it. He doesn't mean for you to do it at every occasion, and make a ministry out of it. So we have to be careful when we're interpreting different types of symbols. The Bible is a book of symbols, but symbols must be interpreted in the light of all other principles that we've learned. Amen? So all of the other principles that we've learned uh, have to be applied uh, for the biblical interpretation. They must never be seen as a source. Symbols, okay? They should never be a source of doctrine. In other words, you set a doctrine and say, this is, this is what it is, this is what it means, and we'll get into some of that tonight. They should only be used to confirm and support the clear teachings of the Bible. So the misuse of symbols and types often allows a person to make the Bible say anything he or she may want it to say. I see that quite a bit with people that take revelation, out of context. I think one of the symbols that I've, I've really talked about quite often is in chapter 12 about the woman and with the sun and the moon and the stars. And they, they, get, all, they get all off on the sun, the moon, and the stars and say, you know, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, qu uh, quantum physics worship that's out there now. Have you ever heard of that? Well, what they're saying now is that worship is a science and that the quantum physics of worship is that you have to get into this realm. And you get into this realm by just a few words, just muttering a few words. You know? And as you mutter these words, it brings you into the quantum physics realm. And that's where the real worship is. That's new age. But see how people can just get so off on, on the scriptures. It's unbelievable. Um, because there is a spirit of truth, but there's also a spirit of error. And you've got to, got to be sure that you know the difference. Some people think they know the difference, but they don't. And they're, in, they're teaching, actually teaching false doctrine. Okay. Why, uh, what is a symbol and how does it relate to biblical study? Symbols are commonly used in all cultures. We've, we've used it in our culture. In the modern world, symbols are used for the purpose of communicating between cultures. That is, uh, handicapped zones, 
toilet facilities, directional signs. You see all kinds of different symbols all over the place. There are several definitions of the word symbol, and that will help us to understand the meaning. A symbol is something such as an object, picture, written word, sound, or a particular mark that represents something else by association, resemblance, or conven uh, convention. That's Wikipedia. Funk and Wagnall's dictionary says this, something chosen to stand for or represent something else, usually because of a resemblance in qualities or characteristics. An object used to typify a quality, abstract idea. Uh, for an example, the oak is a symbol of strength. The oak tree is a symbol of strength. So the interpretation of symbols plays a significant part in real biblical study. So God often used languages of symbol to help impart divine truth. The Bible actually implies that God created much of what we see to be symbolic of things that he wanted us to learn and to understand. So let's look tonight at Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. He'll put that up on the screen. And I have my water. Thank you, whoever got that for me. You will not lose your reward. Okay, it says, for the wrath of God, right? Uh, I'm sorry, verse 18. Romans 1, 18 to 20, 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And just keep going as I keep reading. Uh, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. Okay, so let's stop for a moment. Let's look at that. For the invisible things of him from the creation okay, of the world are clearly seen. For the invisible things of him, what, what are those things? From creation, what are those things? Everybody's looking like, hmm, what? Okay. Well, let's go back to Genesis 1.1. You can stay right on this script. You don't have to go to Genesis. Okay? We all know it by heart, or should be, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? He says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Look at this. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So let's look at it. In the beginning, right? We, we talked about time, space, and matter, right? In the beginning, we have time. God made the heavens, you have space. And the earth, you have matter. Each one of those are a trinity of trinities, right? Time has past, present, future, right? The heavens have space, have, have weight, width, length and height, right? And the earth is made up of solid, liquid, and gas. So you have a trinity of trinities right in, the, right in creation. And it says, even his eternal power and what? Godhead. Where do we see the Godhead in creation? Anybody got a guess? Where do you see the Godhead in creation? My wife's staring at me. <laughs> She's like, what is it? What is it? <laughs> Anybody have a guess how you can see the Godhead? You know what the Godhead is, right? No. Good guess, though. What? No. Yes. Let us make man in our image. He used the plural. Let us make man in our. Who has the only one that has creative ability? 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Did God make the, did God make the creation of the world without Jesus? Or the Holy Spirit? No. Because if you go into Colossians, right, or you go into John, it says all things were created by him. He was in the world, but he created all the things in the world. Right? You go to Colossians, it says all things were made by him, and nothing that was made was not made without him. And he is the light of men. So even in creation itself, you can see the Godhead. There's the Trinity. See, some people say, well, the Trinity is a man-made doctrine. No, it's not. Okay? It's a, it's a biblical fact, even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And even though it's not in the Bible, doesn't mean it's not true. Amen? Okay, the word rapture is not in our English versions. Some people say, well, the word, word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, yes, it is. It's in the Latin Vulgate Bible. Okay? The newer translations interpret it as caught up. But we don't want to get into the, I don't want to get off on that. But anyway, so, so let's go. So that they are without excuse. Go ahead. Next, next verse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Next verse. Next verse. Come on. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and to four footed beasts and creepy things. They started to what? Bring in symbols. Something that was symbolic of God. They begin to worship those symbols. And they begin to fall away from God. Remember the Israelites? When Moses didn't come down from the mountain, what did they fashion? A golden calf. It was a symbol. It wasn't a calf. It wasn't a cow. It wasn't a real one. But it was symbolic of that. And they were using that to worship God. They were going through the symbol, the idol, to God. And that's why it's wrong for, uh, for people to use Christian idols of things like Joseph and Mary and Anthony and all, those, all the saints to go through them to God. It's wrong for us to go through Mary to God. Mary's dead. I know some people don't want to hear that, but she's dead. She hasn't been part of the resurrection yet. She will be uh, when the trump of God will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Okay, but she did not ascend to heaven. There's only one who ascended up to heaven. Okay, well, actually, there was, there's two. Actually, there's three. Okay, there's Enoch, Elijah, okay, and Jesus. But I believe, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, that um, Jesus was the only one that was perfect. Okay, so, all right. So where, where are we? Okay. The next verse. Oh, I'm sorry. I went too far. Okay. Sometimes we make mistakes of thinking that these creations of God were somehow random and that their adoption as a symbol to communicate divine truth is somewhat coincidental. But the truth is, is that God has his divine plan and purpose in mind when he created all things. Everything that God created, he has a purpose for. Okay. So there's no way as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ that you shouldn't ever feel like you're not worth anything. You were created for a purpose. Okay? So don't feel like, well, I don't do this in church, I don't preach, or I don't do that, or I don't do this, or I don't do that. You know, I always say this, if you want, if you want to be a servant of the Lord, serve him in the small things that you can do. And the Bible says, if you if you're, can be entrusted with the, with the little things, you'll be great, you can be trusted with greater things. Amen? Praise the Lord. So what are the primary categories of symbols that are used in the Bible? So let's take note of this. The following categories are taken from your, script, uh, from your Interpreting the Scriptures book by Kevin Corner. And there are seven primary categories of symbols that are used in the Bible. Symbolic objects, symbolic objects, creatures, actions, member, uh, numbers, names, colors, and places. So first, let's look at the symbolic objects. In the scriptures, God often used 
inanimate objects, whether God created or man created, as symbols. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Uh, Psalm 18, verse 2. Oh, he's right on the ball there, huh? The Lord is my rock. Well, God's not a rock. Okay. But people that are not in tune would read this and say, wow, God's a rock. Okay. And if you read the Bible, like if a Hindu would re read the Bible and you see that God is, is a rock or God is a light or God is the door, then pantheism is what they believe in. They believe in God is in everything. <clears throat> and I remember talking to a Hindu one time, and he's, he's, I said, you don't eat meat at all. He says, I don't, eat, I don't eat meat at all because I am a Hindu, and because I'm a Hindu, I don't eat meat because uh, God is in the life of God is in everything. So I said to him, I said, okay, so if the life of God is in everything, what do you eat? He says, all, all we eat all the time is we only eat vegetables. We only eat the vegetables. We don't eat nothing else but the vegetables. So, so I said, well, okay. Well, doesn't a vegetable have life in it? And he looked at me. I says, what causes it to grow? I said, it has to have life, right? And it springs up and it comes life. I says, then you cut that life off and you kill it. I never thought of that before. <laughs> so I made him either never to eat anything again <laughs> or to see the fallacy in what he believed. Okay? Because it's the truth. Okay? God has created everything, but he's apart from that which he created. Okay? His breath is on it. His life is in it. Okay? But he is apart from it. He's above it, beyond it, around it. He's not limited by it. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield. He's not a shield. So what does the symbol shield mean? Well, let's go back one. Let's go back one. What does rock mean? <clears throat> right? The Lord is my rock. What does that, what does the word rock mean? Does it mean a rock? No, it's not literal. So it's symbolic, but what does it symbolize? What is the symbolic meaning of it? What is a rock? Solid. What else? Strength. Right? So the Lord is my strength. He's solid. I can depend upon him. And my fortress, what's that? Is he a, is he a literal fortress? No. He's figurative. It's symbolic. What is a fortress? It's a place of protection. Okay? And my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler. One that stands up for me. And the horn of my salvation. What's the horn represent? Huh? It's not a horn. You know, it's not like, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, really, it's a, it's a animal's horn. But what did they use the horn for? For warning? To celebrate? Jubilee, to call to war. But what else did they use the horn for? This is good. To anoint. He is the anointing. He is the, he is the, the fulfillment for my salvation. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the anointed one. The anointed one who... All power is given unto him in heaven and earth. And so because all power has been given unto him in heaven and on earth, there's nothing that we can't do for him. There's nothing that we can't accomplish for him. Amen? 
And he goes, and my high tower. What's a high tower? He's a high tower? No, he's not a literal high tower. But what does that mean, high tower? Why do you have a high tower? Why, in biblical times, in the culture that they lived, why did they build these high towers? Huh? Not so much for protection. What did they set, in the, what did they set up in the towers? A watchman. God is your watchman. He watches out for you. Okay? He'll tell you when the enemy's coming. And he'll give you a warning. Amen? Psalm 119, verse 105. <clears throat> your word is a lamp. That's symbolic. That's not literal. It's not a literal lamp. You holding a lamp in your, in your hand? Literally? No. What are you holding? Thy word is a lamp. What does a lamp do? Well, okay, go back into biblical times, right? What was uh, the lamp used for? Come on, speak it out. Light. Well, why did, would they need light? Because there was darkness, Right? What does the light do? It expels the darkness. Okay? So it expels the darkness outwardly, but the Word of God also dispels the darkwood inwardly. So the Word is a lamp to my feet. It expels the darkness around me and expels the darkness within me. Amen. That's what the Word does, right? David said, Thy Word have I hid. If his word is like a lamp, it is hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. And a light unto my path. So in other words, so you won't be a, a person that will be left alone to stumble in the darkness because a, a, a non-Christian is in the kingdom of darkness, Right? Because the Bible says he's translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. So you're in the kingdom of darkness as an unsaved person. So you're walking in darkness. You, you don't really know what you, you're just going on doing whatever you're doing. But when the light comes, right, he is the light of the world. And when he comes and he brings that light to you and you get enlightened, you get saved. Okay. Then he comes and lives inside of you. Now that light begins to shine through you. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 18.10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Protection. Strong tower. It's a strong place of protection. The righteous run to it and are safe. He's not, a literal, he's not a literal tower. But symbolically, he is our place of refuge. You know, we sing this song, God is my refuge and God is my strength. A very present help in trouble. Right? He's your refuge. He's a place that you can run to. When you go through a, you know, a sad time in your life, you can run to God because he's your refuge and strength. Amen? Okay, now Hosea 7 8. It says, Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Okay. Okay. It doesn't mean you start a flip flop ministry. Ephraim's not a cake. It's, not, it's symbolic. What is a cake not turned? Half-baked. <laughs> You're right. That's what it is. It's a half-baked. Okay? So when you mix yourself among people, especially the unsaved, you can become half-baked. Not fully committed. Not done. Not complete. Because you're 
mixing. You're not, you're not taking the time, okay, to be with the, the ones that God has ordained you in the light to walk in. If you walk in darkness, you're always among unsaved people, unsaved people. Now, I'm not saying you can't be among unsaved people, because you, when you work, you go, you're go unsaved people. But in your spare time, you should be wanting to be around Christians and inviting Christians to your home and, uh, you know, inviting them to have a have break bread with, with them. You know, and Linda and I are available any night, you know, for supper. Anytime you want to invite us, we'll be more than glad to come. So, you know, you, so you can not be a half-baked Christian. You see, Ephraim is a cake not turned. Ephraim is the one also that God said at one time, leave, don't pray for him. He told, I think it was Jeremiah, he said, don't pray for him. Leave him alone. He's giving himself to idols. You know, God, there comes a time when God just says, enough is enough. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 8. I may not get through all of this, and if I don't, we'll continue next week. He says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens, leaveneth the whole lump? What's he talking about? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Are you a lump? Are you a lump on a log? Well, you know, that's, sim that's symbolic. As if For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. What does leaven do? It permeates. Okay? Don't be permeated with the old leaven of your old life. Okay? That's what it's talking about. Okay, so we have symbolic objects. Now, symbolic creatures. In the scriptures, God often used living creatures, whether plants or animals, as symbols. For an example, Hosea 7.11 Ephraim also is like a silly dove. What's so silly about a dove? It's also like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. No purpose. Here, there, and everywhere. Not solid. You, you'll find most Christians that travel from church to church to church looking for the perfect church, first of all, they'll never find it. Okay, Because if they do, then they'll ruin it because they're not perfect. Okay, So no matter where you go, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence. Okay, and That's symbolic. And the reason why there's more green on the grass or on the other side of the fence is because they use more fertilizer. Okay? A silly dove. Now, we know this is also is like a silly dove. Like. Doesn't mean he is. It means, but he's like that. He's acting like that. They're just going everywhere. Egypt, then you go to Syria. I'm running to this, go running for this church for this word. Go running to this church for this word. Oh, I got a word from this church. Oh, I got I to gotta go see this one. I got to go see this one. I got to go see this one. Always running to and fro all over the place. But my question would be to most of those people that run around, what did your pastor preach last Sunday? Are you holding on to the words of what he spoke last Sunday? Is it just a message, just a, a preaching that you come to hear, good sermon, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and go home? Or is it something that God is putting on the heart of the pastor to give to you from his heart so that you can grow and mature in Christ? Sometimes people don't like that. Luke 13, verse 32 and he said to them, go tell that fox. <laughs> now, God, Jesus is not telling him to go tell a fox 
a literal fox. It's symbolic. Fox is conniving, sneaky, looks for his prey. He said, tell him I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I, sh uh, I shall be perfected. 1 Peter 1.24 All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the fl flower therefore falleth away. Again, Object, grass, here today, gone tomorrow. Okay. You get a whole week or two weeks without rain, what happens to that green grass? Begins to die, right? Why? Because without water, the flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower therefore falleth away. So what's it saying there? What's the symbolic meaning there of grass? Well, in order for grass to survive, you need what? In order for the Christian to survive, you need the water, the washing of the water of the word. The Holy Spirit is symbolic of water, right? When Jesus said, the Holy Spirit shall come in you, you shall have rivers of living water coming out of you, okay? So there's a symbolic meaning there of being healthy by having the water that keeps things alive. The word of the Lord I think the next scripture, the next verse of that, verse 25. 1 Peter 1, 25. Can you just scroll it down there? Good, okay. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. This is more than history. This is more than just words on a page. This is more than just someone's op opinion. This is God's word. Think about that. Not the words of Muhammad, not the words of a, of a prophet. These, this is the word of God that was inspired by God and he inspired men to write this book. Because there's life in this book. You ever read a scripture and all of a sudden it just jumps off the page and it comes alive to you? Amen. John 1 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming, John the Baptist. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Was Jesus a literal lamb? No. He was symbolic. What is symbolic about a lamb? Sacrifice, right? Huh? Innocent? Good. See, as you begin to think, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. What about the lamb? What else is a characteristic of the lamb? What is the one thing they say about lamb? Huh? Obedient? You call a lamb, the, you know, the, the shepherd, when he calls the lamb, they come. They know his voice, right? He says, my sheep know my voice. Okay? Took that from an analogy of a real shepherd calling his sheep. What else? Yep. Yeah. Listens to the father's, the, the, the shepherd's voice. So he's a lamb, which takes away the sin of the world. He's, he's coming submissive. 
You can shear a lamb. You can kill a lamb. Like a lamb to the slaughter. They just, they'll go right in there. Okay. But he's coming back, not as a lamb, but as a lion. We're going to talk about that. Hallelujah. Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. <laughs> brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. What are vipers? Huh? Snakes? What's a, but what, what, what's the characteristic of a snake? Sneaky. What was the serpent in the garden? What was one of his characteristics? He was wiser than all the others. Okay. You generation of vipers. You think you know everything. You Pharisee. You Sadducee. You vipers coming in, sneaking in here. You don't want the truth. You just want to nullify the truth. You just want to stamp out the truth. You don't, you're just going to make them twice the sons of hell as yourself. And he says, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Okay, so we have symbolic objects, symbolic creatures. How about symbolic actions? In the scripture, God often used Prescribed or recorded actions that were meant to be symbolic in nature. Joshua 1.3, for example, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. So actions, that's symbolic. Okay. What's, uh, what's Joshua going to do? Run around the, the entire <laughs> world? You don't know. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Think about this. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon. So people take that to mean today that I can go, I can go anywhere in this world, okay, and I can, and God's given it to me, and I can take it. No, you can't. If God hasn't told you to go there, God hasn't given you authority over there. Guess what? You're not going to get it. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, he was telling Joshua, every place that is part of my covenant that I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every place that your foot will go upon, because they that, they that are, uh, what's that scripture? Um, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So all of his steps, if you stay ordered, if you allow me to lead you and and guide you, as, as I lead and guide you, every way that you go, that your feet shall tread upon, I've given it to you, as I said unto Moses. You can't take what, you can't take what God doesn't give you. Every place that the sole of your foot goes, so that's an action. Okay, Joshua, uh, Psalm 141, verse 2. He says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So prayer, let it be to you as an incense. But it's not a literal in incense. You're not burning it. You're not lighting a prayer, on, putting a prayer on paper, lighting it on fire and letting it be an incense to God. No, it's symbolic. What does that mean? Let, your prayer, let my prayer set, be, set forth before thee as incense. As something that's sweet smelling. Something that is, that'll bring you glory. Something that will bring you honor. Let my prayers not be selfish. Let not my prayers be self-seeking. But let my prayers be thy will be done. Amen? Okay. Um, I don't know if I want to get through all these. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4. Ch uh, chapter 4, verse 4. It says to 13, but I don't see it till 13. But anyway, um, 
I think that's the reference, Ezekiel 4, 4 to 13, but let's just read verse 4. Uh, God asked Ezekiel to do many symbolic acts in, uh, in this section of Scripture that had prophetic significance in relation to the people of God, such as laying on his left side, then on his right side for over a year. Did you ever read about that in the Bible? God told a guy to lay on his left side, then lay on his right side for a whole year. Okay, it says, upon according to the number of days thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. So these are actions we're talking about. Look at symbolic numbers. In the scripture, God often attributed symbolic significance to certain numbers. God gave how many commandments? Ten. Jesus chose twelve disciples, which correspond to twelve tribes, twelve thrones, twelve foundation stones in the eternal city. Some numbers seem to suggest certain concepts because they are frequently used in association with the concept. That is, six is often associated with evil, or 666, six, six, right, evil. Um, seven is often associated with perfection. Forty is often associated with testing, as Moses was tested 40 years in, in Midian. Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus' 40 days of temptation. However, this kind of an association has no basis for making the numbers mean something other than their nominal, literal meaning. If, in other words, if he went 40 years, don't say, well, that was symbolic. He didn't really go 40 years. Okay? A lot of people do that with creation, the seven days of creation. Well, it wasn't really literal seven days. It, was, it could have been millions of years in between. No. No. When God says he made the first day, then he made the second day, it was night, and then it was, it was, there was day, the first day. Okay? Day, then night, that was the first day. Then day, the night, the second day. Okay? It wasn't thousands of years. I don't care what anybody says, because my point to them is this. Well, then how come it's only 24 hours now? What changed? When did it change? And it didn't change. It's been the same thing going on from, from generations. Okay. Um, Okay, though the length of Jesus' temptation is associated with the concept of testing, yet he was still tempted for 40 literal days. It was 40 literal days. Okay. Also, the number 40 is a, is a number signifying probation. So um, let's look at another one. Matthew 18, verse 21 to 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say unto you up to seven times, but unto 70 times seven. That's 490. Okay? Now, that's symbolic, okay? That your forgiveness should be from your heart, okay? Always flowing. It's not just a set 400. What if he sends 491? Well, Jesus said 490, so I'm cutting you off. <laughs> okay? No, but with that, when somebody asks you for forgiveness, you have, to, you have to look at the whole picture, okay? How can I explain this? Okay, I come to your house, you invite me for dinner, okay? And I'm there having dinner, you're in the kitchen cooking, and I, I see your pocketbook is open, and your wallet's on the table. And you have just gone to the bank, and there's like three $100 bills in your, in your, in your pocketbook, and there's a couple of hundred dollar bills coming out of your wallet. And I just happen to go by when you don't see and take those, that money. And then uh, there's nobody else in the house. So after you know it was there before I got there. And so you come to me after you confront me. And then finally I confess to you and say, I did it. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, part of that confession and asking for forgiveness, what's something else that needs to take place? Restitution. <laughs> okay. But if there's no restitution, and Jesus is just saying, well, just forgive, so the next time you invite me and I, I steal more money off of you, are you going to continually invite me to your house? 
you know, you're not going to continually invite me to the house. Either you're going to invite me to your house and you're not going to keep money in your pocketbook. <laughs> okay? The Lord wants you to use wisdom. It's not just saying let people walk all over you and run all over you. That's not what the scripture is saying. Okay? But in your heart, you should forgive. Okay? But because you forgive does not mean okay, that you have to continue in that situation. Okay? If someone's beating you, okay, and I say this to wives because usually the wives don't beat the husband, but that happens. But if husbands beat the wife, okay, you don't have to stay in that situation. Okay? And you, don't, you can forgive, but that doesn't mean you have to go back and live in that situation. This, we've seen too many things happen to people. Amen? Okay. Revelation 13, 18. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. 666. So, does anyone know the numerical value of the name Jesus. The numerical value of Jesus is 888. And the 8 means this. 8 is the number that means new beginnings. Jesus is the New Testament, new beginnings. Okay, let's look at, let me see. Do I, am I going to get through this? Probably not. So I'll give you one, one more partial of this. The next one is symbolic names. <clears throat> in the scriptures, God often used names to be symbolic of individuals or nations. In scripture, a name is often significant of the nature, character, experience, or function of a person. So let's look at that. Uh, Genesis 25, 25 to 26. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. <laughs> so they called his name Esau because he was hairy and he was red. He had red, a reddish hair. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old. Uh, Isaac was 60 years old when his wife bore them. Now the name Jacob literally means surplanter or what? Heel grabber. Think about this. This little baby grabbed his brother's heel. He was also a deceiver. 1 Samuel 4.21 Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And the name Ichabod li literally means unglorious, or the glory has departed. So these are symbolic, not literal things. 1 Samuel 25, 25 says, Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. In this passage, Abigail pleaded with David for her husband, Nabal, whose name literally means fool. Okay? A couple of weeks ago, I think I preached on, uh, was, it, was it a couple of weeks ago? Uh, was it last week? I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I preached on Nahash, right? And Nahash means serpent in Hebrew, okay? And how the children of the king, King Nahash, want to make a covenant with Israel 
by plucking out their right eyes. Okay? Why did he want to take away their right eye? To stop their ability to fight. Okay? Think about that. Okay? It, it, it was symbolic, taking the eye out, but it was also literal. He wanted to take, that, the, 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 he wanted to take the ability of them to fight. Matthew sixteen eighteen, and I'm going to I'm going to close at this one. Matthew sixteen eighteen, and I also say unto you that you are Peter, Petros in the Greek, and on this rock Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this is where the Roman Catholics get it wrong. They say the, church, the Catholic Church is built upon Peter, the Pope, their first Pope. Well, if they go to that extreme, I always say to them, did you know your first Pope was married? And their eyes got as big just like yours did just now. Okay? And they go, what? And I go, yeah, he was married because Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law who was sick of a fever. So if Peter was your first Pope, then the Popes were married. And why did you change that? Uh, yeah, okay. But Peter is the Petros. Now, Petros which means a rock, but it means a piece of a rock or a pebble. So Jesus wasn't saying that he was building his church on a pebble. The characteristic of a pebble is that it can be moved or picked up for the purpose of throwing. The rock on which the church is built is Petra which means a large, massive rock, a cliff, or a ledge. The rest of the New Testament tells us that the Petra is Christ, 1 Corinthians 10.4. The characteristic of this rock is that it is firm, solid, and immovable. Now, when Jesus pointed and said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Remember that, honey? When we were in Israel, we were in Capernaum, was it? wasn't it Capernaum? I believe it was Capernaum when we were there. And we weren't far from where Peter lived. And he was teaching the disciples, and he said, I will build my church in the gates of hell. And he pointed, because there is a place in Capernaum that was known as the gates of hell because that's where all, they had all uh, temple worship, all false gods worship. They worshiped the god of, of um, Pan, I think it was. Wasn't it Pan? Okay, which is like uh, worshiping the god of Moloch and ch uh, sacrifice of children on fire, putting the children on fire and burning them. Okay, so they had several temples built into the stone. Okay, and I think I told you the story before. But well, when Linda and I were there, it became so real to us that Jesus pointed to that and said, the gates of hell, meaning false religions, pagan religions, will not prevail against my church. And when I was standing there, the Lord, the Holy Spirit revealed to me, he said, see, my words are true. He said, because those temples are non-existent now, and you are the church, and you're still in existence. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll, I'll get into the symbolic colors and stuff like that next week, and we'll finish up. Are there any questions tonight? If you don't have a book and you like one, see Linda. She'll get your name and get you a book, and you can get, if you like to study. No questions? So I could give you a test. You all know, you're all knowledgeable now, right? Tired, knowledgeable. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight's study. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care about us. Thank you that we've come to learn your word. And I pray for those who are listening, Father, that you'll touch their hearts, Lord. Let them know, that, Lord, that you care about us. You care about us so much that you gave us your word and these lessons and, and symbols and all of these things so that we can be drawn closer to you. 
Now as we go, Father, I pray you strengthen those who came out tonight, those who are listening by Facebook, those who will view this teaching. We thank you for it, Lord. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise. Keep us safe as we travel home. In Jesus' name, amen.